Thank you, ma'am. Good morning and welcome. Uh, today we are going to discuss pediatric liver tumor. Uh, we have operated few interesting uh, liver tumor in last four or five years. We are going to discuss them. They include benign and malignant both. And uh, before going to discussion, there is little bit difference in uh, adult hepatic surgery and pediatric hepatic surgery. Pediatric liver is usually normal. Uh, it's not cirrhotic. And during dissection, liver parenchyma bleeds profusely. And uh, because of low, relatively low, low blood balloon, we need to be a very meticulous during dissection. And planning should be accurate before going to surgery. To start this uh, year, I invite Dr. Anju. She is assistant professor in my department. She will start now. Dr. Anju. Thank you, sir. So, good morning, everyone. Today we are presenting on pediatric liver tumors, its spectrum and management. This is the overview of today's presentation. We will start with the introduction about the liver tumor, its classification, indication for liver section in children, current risk grouping, staging, few case scenarios followed by our literature, our experience, and conclusion. The pediatric liver tumor. Liver is the third most common site of intra-abdominal malignancy in children, and pediatric liver tumor account for 1-2% to 2 of total pediatric tumor. Majority of the hepatic masses, that is two-third, are malignant. Most common malignant mass we encountered is hepatoblastoma, and most common benign mass we encountered is vascular tumor. Commonly, they are sporadic, but can be associated with some predisposing factor like low birth weight, prematurity, and may be associated with some familial cancer syndrome like backward weedman syndrome and leaf pneumonia syndrome, etc. Complete surgical resection is the most important determinant for long-term survival and cure. As the liver resection is one of the most challenging procedure, it requires proper pre-operative planning to define the anatomy, minimize the blood loss, and confirm the adequacy of remnant liver left. At the time of diagnosis, only one-third tumors are amenable for upfront surgery. So new adjuvant chemotherapy is used, which increases the resectability, improves the survival, and decreases the morbidity in post-op period. As the pediatric liver tumor is a rare tumor, the Children Hepatic Tumor International Collaboration, that is CHIC, had made an attempt to standardize the diagnostic criteria and nomenclature of pediatric tumor on the international scale. And they made a classification based on the tissue of origin, which include epithelial tumor, mixed epithelial tumor, mesenchymal tumor, tumor with biliary origin, metastatic tumor, and mixed hepatocellular and biliary tumor. So coming to the indication of liver resection in children, most common indication is hepatoblastoma that account for 43% of cases of resection, followed by hepatocellular carcinoma, which account for 23% of liver resection, followed by various other benign and malignant tumor. So liver resection in children, it can be primary. Primary resection is done mostly in the cases of benign disease as hemangioendotheloma, hemangioma, mesenchymal hematoma, etc. And in the malignant condition, primary resection is done in the hepatocellular carcinoma and pretext one and two of hepatoblastoma as per COG protocol. And resection after new adjuvant chemotherapy, which we follow mostly, is done in all stages of hepatoblastoma as per sample protocol and in pretext three and four as per COG protocol. Along with this, the hepatectomy is the essential part of resection strategy in 20 to 25% of cases in liver transplantation. And resectability depends on the surgical expertise of their center. So about the margins in liver section, which is very important, it is a bit controversial in children. In adult, it is said that one centimeter of normal liver margin is essential, but in children due to small liver volume and close proximity of a tumor with the major vessel, it is difficult to achieve. But closer margin to hepatic vein, portal vein, and IVC is acceptable, and few millimeter is also enough. And literature has shown that microscopic residue is not associated with inferior result. So what is the role of pre-op chemotherapy in hepatoblastoma? It helps in increasing the receptability rate. It makes tumor more solid, so it gives us better delineation of tumor during the surgery. It also helps in decreases the volume of bleeding during the surgery and also decreases the chances of rupture during the surgery. It has also been documented that primary resection is associated with significantly higher rate of incomplete resection. 
As per cyber protocol, the current restriction rate is 90% for standard risk hepatoblastoma and more than 80% for high risk hepatoblastoma. So, as the liver resection is one of the most challenging surgery, it requires proper pre op assessment for resectability. And it starts with ultrasound in Doppler, which gives us the better delineation of tumor extent and vascular invasion, which is augmented by triple phase CT and 3D reconstruction, which gives us better delineation of anatomy, tumor extent, uh, vascular anatomy, along with the fat planes with the nearby organ. For satellite nodule, we can use diffuse weighted MRI. And nowadays, 3D models are also used, which are made with the help of artificial intelligence, which give us precise detail of uh, anatomy and vascularity before going for the resection. Another adjunct is an intraoperative ultrasound, which is used nowadays, and it helps in the proper delineation of margins while doing the resection. So how much residual liver is acceptable in children? As these children don't have any pre-existing liver disease, 20 to 25% of residual volume is enough. As within the six months of major resection, residual liver mass reaches the 90% of its initial volume. But if the child have any pre-existing liver disease, then we have to assess the hepatic reserve by ICG clearance test and remnant liver volume radiographic assessment. So coming to the basic anatomy of liver, liver is divided into right and the left lobe on the basis of Cantilese line and further divided in eight segments by coronard. And these eight segments are divided in four sectors. The left lateral sector includes segment 2 and 3, left middle sector includes segment 4A and 4B, right anterior sector includes segment 5 and 8, and right posterior sector includes segment 6 and segment 7. Based on this sector, the pretext and post-test staging of vetoblastoma is done. The pretext stage is pre-treatment, staging of tumor, and post-test is post new adjoint chemotherapy, extent of tumor. It has four stages. Pretext one or post-text one is when three contiguous sections are tumor-free. Stage two is when two contiguous sections are tumor-free. When only one contiguous section is free, it is called a stage three. And when none of the section is free, it is stage four. So along with these stages, various annotations are used in pretext staging, which include vena cava and growth, multifocal tumor, lymph node involvement, and distance metastasis, et cetera. So based on this pre-test staging, various risk stratification schemes are, have been made as per COG protocol, Cyopal, German protocol, Japanese, and FIT. Here what we follow is Cyopal protocol, which has standard risk and high risk. Standard risk include pretext 1, 2, and 3, and high risk include pretext 4, and any pretext with any of the annotation, and tumor having a small cell and differentiated histopathology, tumor with AFP level less than 100 nanogram of deciliter, and tumor with rupture. Uh, so this is the cisplatin monotherapy protocol, which is used in standard risk uh, petroblastoma, in which uh, cisplatin is given as a gap of 15 days. And after four cycles, patient is assessed for the uh, response in surgery. And this is the Play-Doh regime, which is used in high risk petroblastoma, which consists of cisplatin and doxorubicin. So uh, what are the basic uh, resections of liver? There are four basic resections. If we are removing four of the right lobe, that is segment five, six, seven, and eight, it's this right hepatectomy. And if we are removing whole of the left lobe, that is segment two, three, and four, it is left hepatectomy. When we are removing whole of the right lobe along with the segment four, then it is extended right hepatectomy and extended left hepatectomy when we are removing whole of the left lobe along with the segment five and eight. Now I invite Dr. Pooja, MC Farrell resident, to proceed with the case scenario. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I will start with the benign case lesions. Our first case is a four-year-old female child presented with the complaints of epigastric fullness for one year, which was rapidly increasing in the size as observed by the parents and also complaints of discomfort and pain by the patient herself for the 15 days. At the time of examination, she was sick looking and also hypertensive and was also severely anemic. Her abdomen examination revealed generalized abdomen distension with a prominent abdomen in the neck veins. And also there is a form to hard lump of the size, 12 into 10 centimeters reaching below the umbilicus, and it is continuous with the liver border. We had proceeded with her evaluation, which was within the normal limits. And her serum alpha ketoprotein is also in the normal limits. But her thyroid profile was deranged and 
uh, in the view of her deranged thyroid profile and also hypertension, we had consulted the pediatric endocrinology de department who had started her on the thyronom and also antihypertension medication. And also in the view of her congestive heart failure symptoms, we had started her on the proper norm. In the radiological evaluation, ultrasound abdomen revealed that there is a heterogeneous mass occupying the entire right lobe of the liver of the size 15 by 12 centimeters with hypervascularity. Here, on the Doppler, we can appreciate that there is a portal vein to hepatic vein shunt. CT angio showed that there is an enlarged liver of the size 18 into with mass 18 into 14 into 12 centimeters of hypodense nature occupying the entire right lobe and also involving the segment 4 mainly with progressive centripetal contrast enhancement. These are the features suggestive of the infantile hepatic hemangioma. As we can appreciate on the uh, CT here, we can see that the entire right lobe is involved and also we can appreciate small lesions in the left side of the liver also. And also MRI was done to rule out the other hemangiomas lesions in the anywhere in the body, which was correlating with the CT with no other lesions and there are no ductal anomalies. So after the counseling of the parents about the complications and in the view of her tumor size, we had taken the patient for the right hepatic artery embolization and post embolization 36 hours later, we had taken the patient for the surgery uh, that is extended right hepatectomy, also including the caudate lobe. Here in the intraoperative picture, we can appreciate that uh, there are multiple lesions occupying the entire right lobe and also on the left side, there are small, small lesions that can be seen here. So segments two and three were spared in view of the less lesions and also for the uh, functional liver remnant. This was done by the total vascular exclusion. After the vascular exclusion only, we were able to establish the proper plane. Postoperatively, her histopathology report was confirmed as the infantile hepatic hemangioma. According to the previous classification, it is hepatic hemangioendothelioma type 1. So in the initial post-operative period, uh, she was showing uh, improvement in the terms of symptoms and was orally allowed also. But around post-operative day seven, uh, her brain output had suddenly started to rise. It was in the range of 300 to 700 ml, which was alarming for her age and also weight. And it was also in the serous nature. And examination revealed that there is an increase in the size of the remnant liver. So in the view of her brain output, we had evaluated for the hypoalbuminemia and also liver's other excretory functions, which was in the normal limits. So we had evaluated with the serial Dopplers and also repeat CT was done. Serial Doppler showed that hepatic artery was having normal color flow and also waveform. However, there is a mild stenosis of the hepatic vein. That doesn't explain her the high drain output and also her condition. So, but, but the repeat CT had showed that there is a progression of the lesion in the left side of the liver, as we can appreciate here, the extinction of the lesions and also the remnant, very minimal parenchyma is seen in the remnant liver. So in the view of her progression of the lesions, her symptoms of respiratory distress had reappeared and also her cardiac failure had worsened further. We try to manage the patient with the help of the medical treatment like fluid restriction and also continuation of the propanol and also other supportive treatment. As per the part of the plan and also as per the request of the parents themselves, we had referred the patient to the other center for the liver transplant. Infantile hemangioma is the one of the most common hepatic mesenchymal tumors in the childhood with the incidence of 12%. These are most commonly diagnosed before six months of age and also female preponderance is seen. They are usually multifocal and some patients about 10 to 40%, there are cutaneous hemangiomas associated. These are of mostly sporadic occurrence, but familial association is seen in the patients with back with Wittmann syndrome. They are mostly asymptomatic, but if they are symptomatic, they are presented with the hepatic mass and rarely associates with the high output cardiac failure also. In the very rare scenarios, they will be associated with the Kasabak merit syndrome. Usually, if a hemangioma is present anywhere in the body, they follow a course of proliferation over the age of six months to one year. Then they reach a plateau of over three to five years of age. And it is expected to involute gradually over the course of five to 10 years of age. So by the age of 10 years, these lesions expect to regress completely. But if there is association with the complications like congestive heart failure as seen in our case and association with the bleeding diathesis, death usually occurs within one month of the life. 
So as seen in our the case, association with the congestive heart failure and presence of multiple nodules and the pathological features like lack of cavernous differentiation indicates a poor prognosis for the patient. So if the tumor is symptomatic or if the tumor is solitary, resection is advised. And in the cases of the unresectable tumors uh, and also with the multiple lesions, initial management is attempted by the use of steroids, that is systemic uh, uh, course, and also the use of beta blockers like propanol as used in our case, and the use of chemo drugs like the vincristine. And if the facilities are available for the treatment of these lesions, it can be managed with radiation therapy and also embolization, which was done in our case. In the case of the extensive lesions or the multiple nodules or the involvement of liver is more than 80% along with the hepatectomy, liver transplantation is advised. Our second case is a five-year-old female child presented with the complaints of mass abdomen observed by the parents for one year, which was progressively increased in the size. And also there is a complaint of early satiety for the two months. There are no other constitutional symptoms. On an examination, she was hemodynamically stable and with mild anemia. There is a mass of the size, 16 to 6 centimeters, which was non-tender and firm in consistency and was continuous with the liver border, but with well-defined lower border. So we had proceeded with our evaluation. Hematological investigations and serum alpha beta protein was in the normal range. She was already evaluated outside in the terms of ultrasound and also CT abdomen, which was suggestive of the probable liver tumor occupying the left lobe of the liver. Here, we had proceeded with the CT angio in the view of the inconclusive findings of the CT from outside. Here, we can appreciate that there is a mass involving the left lobe of the liver of the size 16 to 5 centimeters. And also on, the, on this arterial phase, we can see the enhancement and that we that is involving the segments 2 and the 3. And in the portal phase, we can appreciate the central scar here. These are the features characteristic of the focal nodular hyperplasia. So after the counseling of the parents, we had taken the patient for the surgery that is left lateral segmentectomy. Here in the intraoperative picture, one can appreciate the nodularity of the tumor involving mainly the left lateral segment of the liver and also with the normal liver parenchyma adjacent to it that is mostly segment four. So after the uh, vascular exclusion, we were able to get the proper plane and left lateral segmentectomy was done and there is no evidence of free fluid or any intraperitoneal nodules. Postoperatively, there are no complications and patient was doing well. So histopathology was reported as the focal nodular hyperplasia, which was confirmatory of the radiological findings. Right now, patient is under follow-up and she is doing well. Focal nodular hyperplasia is the second most common mesenchymal tumor, but is of rare incidence of 2%, and it is seen between 2 to 5 years of age. If the lesions are small, they are usually incidental findings and are, they are asymptomatic. But if the lesions are large, as seen in our patient, the pain or the right, mass, right upper abdomen mass will be the symptom. There is a multifocality seen in about 15 to 20% of the cases, and they most commonly involve the left side of the liver. There are no reports of the malignant progression, but there are case reports of association with the hepatocellular carcinoma. Contrast CT and the MRI are the preferred mode of the investigations, but MRI is the most preferred one for this lesion because of the specificity of 98% and sensitivity of 70%. And according to Ang et al., surgical resection is advised if the tumor is more than 5 centimeters as seen in our case, and if there are clinical symptoms again seen in our case, and if there, are, there is indefinite diagnosis. One needs to differentiate the focal nodular hyperplasia from other malignant tumors so that unwarranted chemotherapy can be avoided. Our third case is a 22-month-old male presented with the complaints of mass abdomen observed by the parents at the six months of age, and it was slowly progressive in the size. So the patient was evaluated at various centers at various ages, but uh, there was no conclusive diagnosis and then was referred to the PGI. At the time of examination, patient was well-preserved and also active. And there is an abdominal mass, as can we, one can appreciate here. It is of the size 15 into 15 centimeters, occupying the entire upper abdomen, and it is reaching below the umbilicus also. And it was forming consistency with the well-defined borders. His hematological evaluation and also serum alpha beta protein was in the normal limits. And on the contrast CT, uh, here we are able to appreciate the heterogeneous enhancing lesion occupying the entire right lobe of the liver and it is of multi-septate origin and also cystic nature is there and it is of size 16 by 9 into uh, 17 centimeters and here we can appreciate the uh, normal liver and parenchyma on the left side of the liver. 
So after the counseling of the parents for the complications, we had taken the patient for the surgery that is extended right hepatectomy, also including the quadrate lobe. Here in the interoperative picture, we can see that that is the nodular lesion and also well-defined lesion occupying the entire right side and also slightly extending onto the segment four. And in the post-operative spe resected specimen here, we can appreciate the nodularity here and also the, the tumor margin is free of the nodules or any tumor. Post-operatively, histopathology report was confirmed as a mesenchymal hematoma and his post-operative period was uneventful with no complications. Right now, patient is in follow-up with no uh, issues. Mesenchymal hematoma is most commonly seen below the one year of age and male preponderance is seen. And also they are usually asymptomatic, but if the masses of large size are seen in our patient, they will be presenting with the pain or the mass abdomen. And they are rarely associated with the undifferentiated sarcoma. So the treatment for these patients is mainly surgical, that is resection of the tumor. And in the cases of the extensive mass or the multiple involvement, liver transplantation along with the hepatectomy is advised. Now I invite Dr. Tarun to proceed with the further presentation. Good morning all. So moving on to the malignant lesions, our next case is The next case is a nine years old girl who presented with the pain and lump in the abdomen from last four to five months, which was gradually progressive. So on examination, it was a huge lump of around 20 centimeters, which was firm in consistency, irregular surface and rounded margins, extending from the right hypopernic region to the right iliac fossa, and finger, and it was crossing the midline, and fingers could not be insinuated under the right costal margin. So routine investigations were normal, including the alpha photoprotein levels, except the LDH, which was raised. <clears throat> On the radiological evaluation by the contrast enhanced CT scan revealed an endoexophytic mass, which was arising from segment fourth and fifth and extending in fairly up to right iliac fossa. And this portovenous phase, we can see the peripheral enhancement. And the, in this arterial phase, we can see the multiple dilated tortuous feeding vessels in the arterial phase, which was suggestive of arteriovenous shunting. <clears throat> so this patient was planned for the image guard biopsy, followed by the immunohistochemistry, which showed positivity for vimentin and smooth muscle antigen. So consisting with the, di the diagnosis of malignant mesenchymal neoplasm, most probably embryonal sarcoma of the liver. So the patient was planned for neoadjuvant chemotherapy by VAC regime, that is vincristine, actinomycin D, and cyclophosphamide, and was re-evaluated for resection. So on the radiological re-evaluation, we can see the involvement of same segments of this exophytic mass, but at this time, there is mild decrease in the size of the dimensions along with some presence of some calcifications. So the patient was planned for surgery, that is non-anatomical resection of segment fourth and fifth was done along with the two centimeter of uh, tumor free margins. Here we can see the uh, safe surgical margins after the post-hepatic resection. So histopath confirmed the margins being free from the tumor infiltration. And again, the immunohistochemistry showed positivity for the environmental and smooth muscle antigen along with BCL2. So confirming our diagnosis of undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma of the liver. And this post-operative uh, period of this patient was uneventful and the adjuvant chemotherapy course was completed. And this patient was followed up till one year, but was lost to follow up somehow after that. Till again presented after six months with gradually progressive lump in the abdomen in the lower half, as we can see in the lower half of the abdomen. But on examination, the child was absolutely stable, but had a firm to hard mass in the lower abdomen. And the radiological evaluation revealed a huge mass, which was actually arising from the peritoneum, occupying the almost entire abdominal cavity and displacing the bowel loop superiorly. So this patient was started on the rescue ice chemotherapy regime, that is I-phosphamide, carboplatin, and eropocyte. And after one cycle, the patient showed good response, but was lost to follow up due to COVID period. And uh, recently we came to know about the unfortunate demise of this patient at home. So undifferentiated embryonal sarcoma of the liver is a rare liver malignancy originating from primary mesenchymal tissue and uh, constitutes about fourth common liver malignancy in children with no sex predilection. And with peak age of onset is between 6 to 15 years. If come if we come to the symptomatology, it is non-specific, like abdominal pain, fever, hepatomegaly, 
and the preoperative misdiagnosis rate is high. That is, the radiological evaluation doesn't lead us lead us to the definitive conclusion. So the definitive diagnosis in these cases depends on the histopathology and immunohistochemistry. <clears throat> And uh, uh, these lesions are mainly cystic predominant space occupying lesions with characteristic delayed enhancement. And the post-operative recurrence rate is high as seen in our case and survival it is only 37%. Although the multimodal therapies have come up in, uh, <clears throat> in these cases with improved survival rates, but the overall prognosis and survival rate is poor. So our next case is two and a half years old male child who presented with a lump in the abdomen from last 20 days, which was non-progressive. And also he had a history of neonatal jaundice with pigmented stools with no other constitutional symptoms. The child was well preserved with the abdominal mass, which was irregular and was in continuation with the liver borders and rounded margins. Routine investigations were normal except alpha fetoprotein, which was highly raised to 1,60,000 nanograms per milliliters. So radiological evaluation by ultrasound, <coughs> sorry, the radiological evaluation by ultrasound revealed a mass, subcapsular mass involving segments six, seven, and eight, along with presence of some few satellite lesions. And the contrast enhanced CT scan revealed a mass epicentered in segment five, extending to segment four, A, seven, and eight, and along with sparing of segment one, two, and three, and there was no infiltration of hepatic and the portal veins. The patient was planned for two cut biopsy and the findings were consistent with the hepatoblastoma. So after the radiological evaluation and the histopathological findings, this patient fell under the category of standard risk pretext three hepatoblastoma. So cisplatin monotherapy was planned in this case. And after four cycles of cisplatin monotherapy, and here we can see the uh, significant reduction in the levels of alpha protein with each subsequent uh, uh, cycle of chemo uh, cisplatin monotherapy. So after four cycles of cisplatin monotherapy, the radiological re-evaluation revealed a partial response in form of that the mass is still epicentered in segment five, extending to four B and seven, but now this time the sparing is seen in segment one, two, three, along with seven. So this patient was planned for central hepatic resection, that is removal of segment fourth, fifth, and eighth, and along with mint, uh, a sparing of the right and left major vasculature. Here we can see the involvement of the central hepatic uh, uh, central hepatic region, and this is the post hepatic resection photo along with the safe surgical margins. The histopath diagnosis confirmed presence of foamy histiocytes with lymphomononuclear infiltrate and the resection margins being free from the tumor, and the findings were consistent with the hepatoblastoma. And this patient uh, was followed up till one year as well, but was lost to follow up after that. Our next case is eight months female infant who presented with the lump in the upper abdomen from last three months, which was gradually progressive with no other constitutional symptoms on examination. There was liver mass, which was extending around four centimeters below the right costal margin and eight centimeters below the zephy sternum. Routine investigations were normal except alpha fetoprotein levels, which was highly raised to 1,30,000 nanograms per milliliters. The radiological evaluation by CT and Geo revealed a well defined hypodense lesion, as we can see here, which was epicentered in segment four and compressing the middle hepatic vein. It, uh, it was abutting the left and anterior branch of the right portal vein, and the major arterial supply of this lesion was from the segment four artery. So patient was planned for image guided biopsy followed by the immunohistochemistry, which revealed positivity for AFP and HEPAR1 and confirming the diagnosis of the hepatoblastoma. So after the radiological evaluation and him in a histopathological findings, this patient fell under the category of standard risk PTEX2. So patient was started on the neoadjuvant chemotherapy by cisplatin monotherapy and we can see the after four cycles, the AFP reduced significantly to the normal levels. So radiological evaluation by CT scan after four cycles of cisplatin monotherapy, they build uh, this heterogeneously enhancing this lobulated mass in the left lateral sector, along with some calcifications and extension to the left medial and the right anterior sector. And there was also abutment with, uh, of the intrahepatic IVC near its confluence with the hepatic means. So this patient was planned for extended left hepatectomy, that is removal of segment 2, 3, 4, 5, and 8 were removed. And here we can see the line of demarcation after the occlusion of the vascular inflow. 
and uh, in the uh, and this is the post hepatic resection with the help of energy sources such as harmonic and cusa and post op afp levels drop to normal levels at 300 nanograms per milliliters the histopath confirmed the surgical margins being free from the tumor and the findings were consistent with the hepatoblastoma this patient is still under follow up from the last two years and is doing well so hepatoblastoma is an embryonal tumor which occurs mainly less than three years of age with incidence of 0.5 to 1. Point, uh, 0.8 to 1.5 per million. The risk factors include a prematurity, low birth weight, maternal smoking, alcohol, etc. It's mainly sporadic, but in subsequent slides, we'll be seeing the various syndromic associations. And um, in more than 90% of the cases, hepatoblastoma, we have serum AFP levels more than uh, raised C uh, serum AFP levels. And if uh, AFP levels are less than 100, it portends the worst prognosis as seen in the cases of small cell undifferentiated variant. The radiological evaluation doesn't lead us to uh, distinguish between the hepatoblastoma and hepatocellular carcinoma. If we talk about the extra hepatic disease, lung is the most common site, which is involved in around 20% of the cases. And the two most common staging system well known are the COG and CIOPL. COG is post-surgical, depends upon the uh, extent of the resection. And CIOPL is pre-surgical, which is based on the pre-treatment extent of the tumor. It has tendency to overstage, means it doesn't differentiate whether it is the tumor in growth or the compression caused by the tumor. So it has tendency to overstage the tumor. And in coming over to the pathology, it is a multinodular, well demarcated, non encapsulated tumor with the, some microscopic features such as the areas of necrosis, hemorrhage, and even microcalcifications can be seen. So, microcalcifications basically denote the presence of the osteoid tissue within the tumor. And some variants such as the pure fetal histology carry the good prognosis, and the line of management required is surgery alone. And small cell undifferentiated, as already discussed, has poor prognosis and is chemo resistant. And, uh, it has AFP levels less than 100 nanograms per milliliters. And cytogenetics reveal trisomy of 2, 8, and 20 with unbalanced translocation of chromosome number 1. The presentation in these cases is mainly asymptomatic, but sometimes acute abdominal features such as due to rupture and signs of virilization and sometimes precautious puberty can be seen due to the ectopic release of beta-SCG from the tumor and rarely fractures as a part of paraneoplastic osteoporosis. And some other rare presentations, such as a tumor lysis syndrome, uh, although it is um, uh, low risk in cases of solid tumors, hypertension is again due to the perineoplast as a part of perineoplasm, uh, uh, due to the ectopic release of renin from the tumor. And isosexual precautions puberty already discussed due to beta SCG, and hypocalcemia is also a part of perineoplastic syndrome. The follow-up, according to the CIOPL guidelines, reveals uh, uh, routine physical examination, alpha fetoproteins, abdominal ultrasound, chest x-ray every two to three months for first three years, every four to six months for two years, and then yearly for five years. And if we come talk about the outcome, the event-free survival and overall survival in case of standard risk hepatoblastoma is 83% and 95%, respectively, and 76%, 84% in high-risk cases. In cases of relapse, the main line of management is surgery and chemotherapy. And if you talk about liver transplant, the main indications are unresectable cases or recurrent, uh, recur recurrent cases in which uh, salvage liver transplant is required. The unresectable five-year survival is more than 80%. But in case of salvage liver transplant, uh, the five-year survival is only 40%. So this is the syndromic association with hepatoblastoma, which includes association with the familial adenomatous polyposis, back with Biedman, Lyphamani, trisomy 18, and glycogen steroid disease, etc. So I invite Dr. Priya Matthews to come over the stage and present the data. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tarun. Uh, next, I'll be discussing our experience in dealing with childhood hepatic tumors during five years. That is from June 2018 to July 2023 and compare them with other centers in India. So during last five years, total of 18 patients with hepatic tumors were operated in our department, of which 10 were males and eight were females. Ages ranged from five to 108 months with median of 17 months. An age of presentation for four kids was less than one year. So amongst these tumors, 14 were malignant. 
hepatoblastoma was the most common liver tumor, accounting for 13 patients. The next malignant tumor was embryonal sarcoma, seen in one patient. Benign tumors included one each of focal nodular hyperplasia, infantile hepatic hemangioma, and two of mesenchymal hematoma. So as for pretreatment extension staging of malignant tumors, out of 14 kids, seven belonged to pretext three, and one kid had pretext four. And after four cycles of chemotherapy, there was downstaging with nine kids now in post-text two. As per SIOFL, eight kids with standard risk hepatoblastoma received cisplatin monotherapy. Five kids with high risk hepatoblastoma received cisplatinum and doxorotocin. And one with embryonal sarcoma received vincristine, actinomycin D, and cyclophosphamide. On the basis of anatomic description of functional segments, there are different types of hepatic resection. At our center, five kids underwent right hepatectomy, five had right extended hepatectomy, one had left hepatectomy, uh, another one had left extended hepatectomy, and one had central hepatectomy. Three kids underwent left lateral segmentectomy, and two had non-anatomical resection. Now, 13 kids underwent major resection, wherein three or more liver segments were removed. And five kids underwent minor resection, wherein two liver segments or they underwent non-anatomical wedge resection. The intraoperative blood loss ranged from 50 to 350 ml, and the operative duration ranged from 120 to 450 minutes. There was no ductal injury or tumor rupture seen. The perioperative complications included one case of intraoperative hemorrhage, which was controlled successfully, two cases of transient hypoglycemia on postoperative day zero, wound infection was seen in two kids, which was managed with antibiotics, optimal nutrition, and daily dressings, necessitating a longer duration in the hospital. One child had subacute intestinal obstruction and one had minor bile leak, which was also managed conservatively. There was no mortality related to surgery and there were no life-threatening complications noted with chemotherapy. The follow-up period ranged from one to 60 months with median of 12 months. Out of 18 patients, one had benign pathology and was referred to a liver transplant center. One patient with embryonal sarcoma had recurrence and unfortunately passed away. Two kids were lost to follow-up. 14 kids were alive at last follow-up without any active disease. And as you can see, the highest number of patients, that is nine, had follow-up between 12 to 24 months and five had follow-up period of more than three years. This shows the distribution graph of follow-up of our 18 patients with maximum follow-up between one to two years. Here, the data sheet of all operated liver tumor patients in our department is shown. The last four patients, which is highlighted in green, had benign pathology, out of which one was referred. And of all the 14 patients in the malignant group, two were lost to follow-up and one passed away. Now, as hepatoblastoma is the most common primary malignant liver tumor in infants and children, we'll be sharing our experience in dealing with it. So we had total of 13 patients of which eight belonged to standard risk category and five in high risk category. In standard risk, the age ranged from 10 to 36 months with male to female ratio of one is to one. One child was lost to follow up and there was zero mortality. In high risk, we had five patients with age ranging from five months to 36 months, male to female ratio of four is to one. One child was lost to follow up and there was zero mortality seen. The overall event free survival time was 51.27 months with 95% confidence interval. Loss to follow up was considered as an event as there was no mortality recorded in our group. 
the survival probability was compared between high risk and standard risk patients. As there was no mortality reported during follow-up, we are getting a very good survival time for both standard and high risk groups. However, there is a good difference in the mean survival time between both groups. That is in standard risk, we have 53.14 months and in high risk, we have 30 months. Also, as you can see, the p-value was found to be statistically insignificant. However, this doesn't hold much value as the tumor is very rare and a sample size was very small. Here we are comparing the outcomes of standard and high-risk hepatoblastoma in various IOPA studies. In standard risk, the three-year overall survival was 91% in SIOPL2 and 95% in SIOPL3. And three-year EFS was 73% in SIOPL2 and 83% in SIOPL3. And in high-risk category, the three-year OS and EFS progressively rose with each subsequent SIOPL study. Um, there is paucity of literature on pediatric hepatoblastoma and their treatment in Indian subcontinent. So here we have compared our data with various other specialist centers in India. As you can see, the largest number of patient pool was 157 from Tata Memorial Center in Mumbai, out of which 91 patients underwent surgery. And when it comes to mortality and recurrence, our results were comparable to other centers like Ames Delhi, Global Health City Chennai, and Kedwai Memorial Institute in Bangalore. Our event-free survival rate also compares favorably with those of other centers, with EFS in standard risk at 87.5% and in high risk at 80%. Uh, to conclude the session, I would like to invite our HOD, Dr. Basan Kumar, to come onto the dais. Thank you, Priya. There's not much to conclude. Only one thing I want to say. Most post-text 3 patients who have one hepatic vein and one portal vein, they can be excised, uh, surgery can be done successfully. And uh, as uh, I have already said, uh, Meticulous planning is necessary to deal with such kind of tumor. And if tumor is unresectable, early referral is uh, essential for liver transplantation. Thank you.